So did you guys enjoy that video on the little linear amplifier that we built for our peanut whistle AM transmitter that only puts out about 250 milliwatts? Uh, the linear amplifier brought that up to the 5 watt level where I was able to make a contact with a buddy uh, it's located uh, a few miles away and uh, you know we we had fun and uh, proved that the the audio modulation was was good he was coming in about the same uh, level as uh, he was hearing me so I think we were doing okay with that circuit so next I want to get into the guts of the thing um, how the construction was was put together um, some of the issues that I ran into trying to run the uh, 5763 as opposed to the 6146. So one more thing we didn't mention, you know, we've been talking about grounded grid topology versus grounded cathode topology. And uh, we said that grounded grid has less distortion, simpler, fewer parts, and certainly more popular. With a grounded grid amplifier, uh, the capacitance between plate and cathode is so small, generally we don't need to neutralize them. It helps, of course it helps, it always helps to neutralize an amplifier, and it always lowers distortion, by the way. But, um, in a common cathode type circuit, you almost always have to have neutralization to keep the input separated from the output. So that's the discussion. Uh, what's one more thing we didn't talk about with the grounded grid? Ah, we're driving the cathode, so it's a natural low impedance. Sometimes you can get away with just driving the cathode without an input tuned circuit. If you have an excess of power, for instance, a 5 watt driver, and the amplifier only needs a couple of watts, a lot of people stick a big old non-inductive resistor on the input of the uh, grounded grid amplifier, and it produces almost a perfect 50 ohms, and it simplifies the design yet more. It gets rid of one complete tuned circuit. So that's the grounded grid versus the common cathode circuit. So as I started to build the 5763 amplifier, I began to, of course, collect parts. And uh, I knew that I wanted to put everything underneath the chassis that I could to make the wiring simpler. And uh, I kind of made a joke about the tubes being in the horizontal orientation, but uh, it just makes it easier to wire under the chassis. Um, it made it easy to get a fan on it. Um, these tubes are modern in construction. The filaments are supported rigidly. It's not like the filament's going to droop like in the old-fashioned uh, older tubes from the 20s and 30s. Uh, these tubes are very happy to be horizontal in orientation. There's no trouble there. So when I was picking out parts, of course, you have to make decisions on what's in your junk box, what do you need to buy. The first thing I wanted to make clear is uh, I did use the HC49 crystal to make that little 15-mile contact that we had in the uh, second video. Um, the uh, FT243s work perfectly, but I wanted to let you know that the uh, HC49 crystal uh, was very well behaved in the Tri-Tet oscillator and had just as much activity as the FT243, maybe even a little bit more. So you can argue back and forth on whether you need to use ceramic type components or phenolic type components, but both of these are high quality sockets. You'll have no trouble using something like this. Uh, the plate cap, similarly, if it can hold up to the abuse of a television, it can certainly hold up to the abuse of uh, this little amplifier. Uh, uh, the air ducts or the mini ductor type coil material was handy. I used it. Uh, then I, I switched over to a hand wound coil uh, because it allowed me to squeeze and separate the coil to do the fine tuning with the Pi output tank. So that's an advantage of using heavier wire like this uh, number 14 or number 12, whatever it is, compared to using uh, perhaps the number 18 or 16 uh, mini ductor. Uh, what about the Q and the performance of these two coils? I think you'd be hard pressed to find any difference between the two. So again, the 5763 and the 6146 were both considered, so I made the socket setup such that I could uh, use either an octal socket 
or the small nine pin miniature socket without having to completely destroy the uh, uh, the radio so I did that ahead of time I knew that I was probably going to switch over to a 6146 even before I uh, I designed the radio now I uh, I'll show you what the Motorola changeover switch looks like that I stole from an old Motorola radio from the 50s, but you could just as well use a, uh, a relay like this as long as it's a 6-volt uh, relay. So let's look at the specifications of the 5763. I was encouraged because with very low drive here, 150 milliwatts, this thing apparently can do 10 watts in Class C. So uh, there was hope that I could get maybe four or five watts out of this thing and that's where I started. Unfortunately as we've been learning uh, it really is all about your plate dissipation and that's the real limitation in being able to get power out, carrier power out, uh, because uh, you have to take into consideration those peaks that you get during modulation and that means you have to set the carrier somewhere around uh, one-third to one-half of this dissipation and that takes a lot of the efficiency away in class AB you don't end up getting all that power output you thought you were going to get. Here's where I started with the 5763 um, it was fairly well behaved it neutralized just fine we will go through neutralization and I'll do it with the 6146 but I assure you they both neutralized with the same components I didn't have to adjust anything they both had a similar capacitance and the final uh, 5763 if you want to include the changeover relay looks like this and uh, I didn't bother putting in a uh, standby switch which would open this contact thus putting the full negative 100 volts on the grid and cutting it off with this small tube I just let it run and uh, it, it was okay so again uh, with 6 watts dissipation just to keep it happy with linear service and uh, keeping this screen down to 200 volts I was only able to get about 2 watts out of carrier for 8 watts PEP AM. Also notice that we switched from AC to light up the filament to DC because we had to have a fan and we have to be able to run the relay. So we're lighting the tube up with DC instead of AC. So here's the uh, 5763 socket uh, again the fan uh, uh, right over the tube to to eliminate the uh, the heat coming off the tube the 100 puff tuning cap the 365 puff output loading capacitor use about half of that when you're properly loaded and the output tank here's that old Motorola relay you can see it's something that I took out of an old radio remember the radios in the 50s mostly ran on 6 volt power because that was the battery inside most automobiles Here's a close-up of the relay with the protection diode across the coil. And again, looking at the tank, looks like in my desperation to get more power out of the 5763 and 6146, I doubled up the grounding, grounding everything as best I possibly could to try to get every milliwatt out of the circuit. Here's the final uh, schematic of the 6146B circuit we have the changeover relay uh, we have the fan uh, and we have a cutoff really a second uh, smaller relay that cuts off the uh, the tube and allows it to be very cool when you key up when you're key down to send it closes this puts it into class AB and uh, now you're on the air now the other style of relay is to have one that uh, detects the RF and automatically switches in the, the uh, linear you're not having a separate receive and antenna and transmitter you're using a transceiver with the linear and for that setup uh, refer back to the T175 night kit schematic uh, from video 2 okay here's the part that uh, quite a few people are going to have problems with um, this is called neutralization neutralizing the beam power tetrode or beam power pentode 
and uh, especially neutralizing the 6146 and all its brothers and sisters have become almost mythic in uh, folklore and uh, you'll hear all kinds of stories about problems trying to neutralize these uh, these tubes. I changed out the tubes. Now it doesn't work anymore. These are supposed to be better. Instead it burned up my radio. How do I do neutralization? Well back in the, uh, the very early 50s um, a method was developed for these tubes. As they developed so did the neutralization techniques. And uh, the Brune technique, Brune, uh, is what I'm going to be using in this radio. Now the Brune technique is interesting because it takes the grid coil and lightly bypasses it at the bottom of the coil. So instead of having a couple of point double O ones or a point one and a point O one on the bottom of that grid tank like you normally would have, instead we lightly bypass it. And I have a uh, 560 puff cap to ground there. That allows me to inject some of the energy from the plate back into the bottom of the grid coil, thus being out of phase with the top of the grid coil, and you affect negative feedback, and you're able to null the bridge. So that's what we're going to be doing. I'm using the receiver and its S meter as my indicator. I'm using my signal generator on frequency as the generator. I'm going into the output port. Okay, this is the output port from the generator. I'm guaranteeing 50 ohms. I have a 6 dB pad here. I'm going into the receiver and again a 6 dB pad. I'm guaranteeing 50 ohms in both places because our amplifier is 50 ohms in and 50 ohms out. And that will uh, allow some different conditions to be met when we have a perfect match. Also I'm doing it on frequency. All of these things will affect a fairly good uh, neutralization. Now typically what I like to do first is I, I want to rough tune the amplifier's input and output. Okay, I've got the bias set for 30 milliamps, which is approximately uh, a half of the dissipation of the tube. Not quite half the dissipation of the tube at almost uh, 400 volts. One, two, one, two, one, two. Hello, test, hello, test. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. And you can see, uh, hope you can see the watt meter over here. Um, if you look at the watt meter, when you're talking with AM, it should be kind of wiggling back and forth. It shouldn't be doing downward modulation. It shouldn't be doing upward modulation. Just kind of wiggling back and forth as you, as you speak. So the first thing we want to do is we want to rough tune the amplifier. And that means the input and the output circuit of the amplifier. That's the, the grid tuning and the plate tuning and the loading. So let's peek that up. Make sure we got everything peaked up. It looks pretty good actually. Let's bring the level down so we can see what we're doing a little more. Looks like we're peaked up pretty well. Let's touch up the grid. Touch up the grid as well. Oh, everything looks pretty good. Oh yeah, we're fine. Okay, then we take the level down so we can see what we're doing. Now, this is a neutralization cap right here. This is the neutralization cap. It's connected to the bottom of the grid coil. This wire comes around and it goes to a series capacitor and then it goes right to the bottom of the 
plate parasitic, right where the choke comes in. You could just as well attach it to the other side of the parasitic, but I like to do it at that point. It's more convenient. Now we're going to be rocking this capacitor right here and going for a null. Let's see if we can hear it first. Now the way I have that trimmer set up, it should be fairly insensitive even if I use a metallic tuning device because I have the grommet in there so it can't really short against anything. So first we'll try to get on there with, with this screwdriver. Haha. <laughs> we have now balanced the bridge. We've neutralized the 6146B. Now if I plug a 6146A or a 6146 or some other variant, I will have to do that again to make sure I get the proper null because the capacitances are different inside the tube. But we know now this guy is neutralized. Now I call this the backwards method because we are going into the output and measuring on the input. Let's do it again watching the meter. So, of course, best done with a tuning tool that is insulated. But since we have no high voltage or bias on the circuit, we only have the DC to light the tube. And that's important. The tube is lit. And the relay is actuated so that we're connected. But I don't have any other bias on there. Would it be better to do this with bias on the tube? Well, I'm not really that brave. But certainly, if you put bias on the tube, you had it properly biased, and repeated this test, remember you're not actually transmitting, you're not putting any RF out, you're not going to hurt your receiver. Uh, but again, that's another reason why you have the receiver on the input side. You don't want to put the receiver on the output side in case that thing takes off and oscillates, it would blow up your receiver. So the answer is yes. If we had bias on this, you would affect even a more perfect neutralization because you'd be neutralizing it in the class AB uh, mode that it's being used in. Okay, with, uh, oh, 55, call it, milliamps at uh, 390 volts. That's what's it. It's about 15 watts input power, and we're only getting out four. <laughs> so that's not very much efficiency. That's 20% uh, or something like that. So that's what we're getting with this linear right now, about 20% efficiency. Not, uh, not ideal, but you know what? I haven't really optimized anything, but it is doing the job. For what I want it. Whiskey 2 Sierra Whiskey. Whiskey 2 Sierra Whiskey from Whiskey Uniform 2 Delta. Whiskey Uniform 2 Delta. Do you copy, Spence? So, was this project a practical transmitter? Think of it. We have a one tube transmitter, it's suppressor grid modulated, so we accomplished that. But in order to amplify it from a quarter watt up to five or six watts, we had to use a 6146. And even if we put 750 volts on this, I wouldn't expect that we get any more than maybe nine or ten watts out of this system. Now, if we wanted to bring it up to a practical level of, say, 25 watts maybe, uh, 20 watts out, um, I think you would have to use two 6146s, and you probably would have to add a buffer stage like a 5763 
and now you'd end up with a four tube solution in order to get your you know your 25 watts of AM out using this linear efficiency modulation type system. So that brings us back to well wouldn't this be easier to do with high level plate modulation? Good old-fashioned high level plate modulation with tubes. It's tried and true, it works very well. Well let's look at that next and that's why I have the mobile manual out. There are a lot of circuits in the mobile manual that fall right into that class. Let's look at one of those simple circuits and see if that's a better solution than our efficiency modulation linear amplifier approach. I hope you can see this particular project. This guy is a practical mobile transmitter and it's got a, uh, an oscillator that can be crystal controlled that's a 5763. What a coincidence, right? And then it has a driver that's a 5763, and that is driving a 6146 final. And this thing looks like it will cover 10 meters. Now, we would need to have a modulator for that. So if we turn the page, here we have a nice 25 watt class modulator that would modulate that very nicely. So if you count tubes, there were three back there. For the transmitter, and we have a 12AX7 and a pair of 6L6s for the modulator. So that's a total of five tubes. This should easily be able to do something on the order of 25 or 30 watts out, but uh, it's going to cost you some parts. Um, for instance, uh, you're going to need a modulation transformer about this size, you're going to need a pair of 6L6s. But you only need one 6146, and you're going to get more out than using a pair of 6146s with the linear approach. So it will cost you a modulation transformer and so on, and it will be a little bit bigger and heavier, but it will not be so wasteful for power. And uh, that's kind of the way it was done back in the 50s and 60s when we had some sunspots and everybody was putting 10 meter rigs in their car and uh, I hope we get some good sunspots here on cycle 25 where we can take advantage of 10 meters again and I hope we have a resurgence. So I hope you've enjoyed this series on linear amplification and uh, maybe this has inspired you to build a, some tube circuits for a change.